since we are moving and grooving with some more nutrition-based information, what has been your favorite go-to pre-workout meal recently? Pre-workout meal. So my pre-workout meal for a long time has been jasmine rice, chicken, and black bean. Now the black bean is a little ballsy and I think it's more of an enjoyment of texture rather than it being the premium pre-workout protein fat source, Mm -hmm. but it's just been my my go-to. It sits really well on my stomach. Um, Some of you that are listening may recall times back on my story where I had this exact meal far too close to yoga. And I said- Literally 10 minutes before going into a hot yoga session. It was tight. And- um, (laughs) It's stupid. <laughs> <laughs> I survived, and uh, but it's it's still my favorite meal. What about you? Uh, I love when breakfast can be my pre workout meal. So some pancakes, some hash browns, some bacon. But otherwise, uh, then my second meal, which is jasmine rice, ground turkey, and then some spinach, just to feel healthy. Honestly, just to it's, feel healthy. It's huh? chopped up really fine, like you don't even taste it. But it's more so because I like want to add some color and feel like I am the epitome of health. That is how I recommend people incorporate spinach into mm-hmm. their diet. Just cut it up as fine as cilantro mm-hmm. and you're not even going to notice it. And of course, tortilla chips are included in that. That's like a no duh. <laughs> no duh. But we're going to go into some questions. Now, the last Q&A we did on nutrition, we knocked out a bunch of questions and we gave some background on them. They weren't just like yes or no, but we are going to be just going over three main questions today. So if you are listening along and you did listen to the other one, we appreciate any feedback that you have for us or any questions you want us to add to the docket to continue on giving some more nutrition advice as a whole. Uh, So we're going to go ahead and dive in. Question number one, can a diet be a lifestyle? It certainly can be a lifestyle. And I think that the the greater question or, or statement that needs to be made is that your diet is going to impact your lifestyle because of how entrenched your diet is or how food and beverage are into our culture. It's going to impact your lifestyle of how you approach your diet. I think another thing is that you'll need to make lifestyle changes if you're going to be making diet changes for the most part. So do you believe that if it becomes your lifestyle, it can be done in a positive way? I do think that it can be done in a positive way. Um, I don't know if it's necessarily that the diet is your lifestyle is the positive aspect, but reframing it of diet is a part of your greater lifestyle change. And it is a a positive impact of it is enriching your day-to-day activity. It's enriching how you feel. It's enriching your self-confidence. It's enriching how um, your mind is working. Like there's so many things that diet is going to positively impact that by having those lifestyle changes or, or diet being a larger part of your lifestyle can be positive. Now, what would you say in regards to the opposite of would it be something that if someone made their diet, their lifestyle, that it could be done in a negative way? So in in that instance, it's going to be more of the extremes. And we see this with everything. When someone makes a religion their all of their lifestyle, or they're making a specific type of training, their lifestyle, like it, it is forced upon others around them. And if you're not doing it exactly like you, they're doing it, then you're a problem or you're doing things wrong. So that's where it becomes more problematic. And also if we're doing something like keto or paleo or whatever is, is something that is eliminating one of the macronutrient food sources, it makes the, the lifestyle side of things very challenging for when you go out to eat or when you go over to a friend's house or you're caught in a bind um, on a road trip and need to be able to get something to eat and you can only eat these specific things, that's where really it becomes a, a challenge or can be more negative for someone's life um, that they may find themselves in. I agree with that. And I think that I, I think the times that I've ever made it like my entire lifestyle and or made it my personality is when I've been in prep in the past of that's it kind of has to become your personality and your lifestyle because it is so specific of what you do. But I think that it's really important when you're taking things into, okay, my day-to-day life, this is how, again, my lifestyle overall is going to be. And lifestyle, I think, really includes 
not only what you eat, but what you do on a day-to-day basis, um, what things you enjoy doing, what things you want to be a part of your life. And so when I think of it in that way, I think of For example, we just had Easter, and I want to be able to sit down and eat a roast that my mom made instead of being like, what are the macros for this, or does this fit my macros, or this doesn't perfectly fit, so I'm not going to eat it, or I don't know how to track it, so I'm not going to eat it. That would be something where I might be then making everything about my diet, my lifestyle, instead of making it a part of my lifestyle. So my question becomes for you of... Do you have to go through a phase of of a diet or a nutritional approach being your lifestyle to thereafter have it be a part of your lifestyle? I think it's a semi-natural progression overall with anything that you do in life is that you are going to sometimes go one extreme or maybe overcorrect and then have to bring it back to center. And I'll say that that's even been the case for fitness in my life of I kind of overdid it to begin with because I was so excited for it. I was getting into it. And then you have to find kind of what that perfect medium is or that harmony of how things all mix together. Because when we talk about like a term like balance, That's something where in the past I used to really think that means, okay, things are 50-50 or everything has an equal part in my life. But I like to use the word harmony more because things can harmonize at different amounts. Sometimes fitness is going to be more in my life. Sometimes it might be a little bit less prominent. Sometimes a certain type of dieting might be more prominent or less prominent. And it's just that life is going to change and you are going to change and likely your circumstances and lifestyle are going to change as you progress through life. And so it's something of having that flexibility to harmonize instead of being in a place where it's like, this is how I do it for the rest of my life. Because I really like to think about application as a whole of how does this apply to my life right now? And then being able to make decisions from there. I like that viewpoint. I, I'm I'm curious if it's just me um, that, you know, you have to go this path of going too far to know where the boundary is at to be able to find that middle ground. Because that is, like you said, um, how I have done Absolutely everything. It's like literally whatever I get into, I've got to kind of burn myself with whatever the thing is to know that the stove is hot before I can take that step back and find that middle ground. Um, but also on the note of, of a dietary intake, to be able to strengthen your knowledge and for it to become second nature, if I look at a you know a specific amount of, of chicken on a plate and I can say this is four ounces, this is five ounces, I kind of have to entrench myself Mm -hmm. and make it like a really, really big part of my life to, you know, strengthen that understanding. And so you have to go through that phase to be able to get to that point. So then that kind of strengthens my thought process that you've got to take the boundary a little bit further to be able to come back. Well, just think about anything that you are learning in life. You kind of have to dedicate yourself to a certain degree to learn a certain amount before it becomes second nature to you for anything. Let's even take you learning how to program. At first, it was likely something where you were spending more time on it, having to figure things out, having to double check things and really focus. Whereas now it's basically second nature for you. Like you, your brain works in such a way where it's like I've garnered and harnessed all of this information to be able to have the flexibility and just the ability to understand this without all of the constant effort that it took previously. I agree with that. So to wrap up this first question, if someone was to come to you and say, for me to take control of my nutrition and uh, does my diet have to be my lifestyle, how would you direct them? I would say that first diet is not just I am dieting or I'm eating eating this certain way. Diet is just whatever you eat. So it doesn't have to be of I am dieting when you talk about your diet overall. Your diet is just going to be what you eat. And when you think of it that way of what you eat doesn't have to become your whole entire lifestyle. It's a part of your lifestyle. So I would just tell someone of like it's going to be a part of your lifestyle, but it might vary of how much or how prominent it is in your life. Awesome. 
awesome. I can agree with that. Low reps is best. High reps is best. Fruit is so it's good. It's terrible. For you. you should lift heavy. High reps. Carbs low are needed. Keto squats are bad for your Squats are great. You for should your squat ass to grass. Toes. It's fine. It fits my macros. For idiots. When there are so many mixed messages going around, it's hard to know what you should even do or focus on. But that's exactly where physique development one on one coaching comes in. You might have heard of online coaching or even hired a coach before, but we believe in teaching you the why behind what we do while truly taking your life into consideration. We want to train, educate, and empower you to reach your goals and help you to stop spinning your wheels and just finally feel good. And hey, we're here to help you look good too. You need you. Your health is your wealth. So join Physique Development and let us be the last coach you ever need. All right. Our second question, how does nutrition impact your overall health? How much time you got? <laughs> uh, nutrition impacts so much in our day-to-day -day life. And between exercise, diet, and sleep, those are going to be like the three main movers in just your overall health and how you function on a day-to-day -day basis. Yeah, I, I would say that with those three rocks, if you are able to strengthen your nutrition, if you're able to strengthen your exercise and just overall activity and then have quality of sleep, your overall health is going to be in a pretty awesome spot. You focus on those things. Obviously, there's nuance within all three of them. But if you're able to control those three factors, you're going to be in pretty damn good health. Now, if we get a little bit more into the nitty gritty of what is nutrition providing or improving for you? So the first thing is going to be energy. It's, it's going to be your first source of, of energy for all of your daily tasks. I can imagine that there are a handful of you listening to this that depend very heavily on caffeine. You look at caffeine as more of your energy source because nutrition is looked at as maybe a negative and because of a history of dieting or wanting to lose body fat, you're always looking at nutrition as I need to eat less, I need to be smaller. And so then you're dependent on these other stimulants to provide you with energy. And I would love for you, as you're listening to this podcast, to be able to shift your mindset to a place of few, food being fuel instead of I need to track my food so that I can be skinnier or I can lose weight. And I you know, use this as encouragement to see it as fuel, to see this as your energy source instead of it being the next Starbucks drink or um, the next energy drink pickup, like really looking at it from a fuel source perspective. Yeah, I think that there was a while maybe back in like 2016 timeframe where people were trying to really get away from food just being fuel because then people just looked at it as a means of like, like input and output, which I think can be helpful. And that's why I'm kind of glad that now as we get into 2024, people are coming back to really iterating that food is fuel. Because while food is so many other things, it's information, it's tradition, it's your grandma's cooking, it's so many things. At the core of it, it is fuel. And I don't think enough people conceptualize that because they've now looked at it as something that is either bad or something that is just a means to an ends or something that they need to be able to manipulate for fat loss instead of being able to see of this is what is going to allow me to perform the things that I need to and achieve the goals that I need to, regardless of if your goal is muscle loss or fat gain or even just being better at your career, you are going to need food. You are going to need fuel to be able to achieve those things. I, I do want to just correct one thing that you said is that they the goal may be muscle gain or fat loss. You had said- <laughs> muscle loss or fat gain. You know, some people might have the, gain, the goal <laughs> it of may fat be their gain. Goal. <laughs> you never know. <laughs> you never know. Um, another thing that nutrition is going to be helpful with is immune function. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I know many of you listening have some snotty nose little ones coming back from daycare or school that are bringing you all kinds of illness. You're battling off the cold, the flu, all these different things. And so if we can manage our nutrition and keep ourselves in a place where we are well satiated with quality whole foods, micronutrients being prioritized, vitamins, vitamins and minerals, our immune function is going to be in a much better position and you'll be sick less. Yeah. So it's a win-win. Win-win. <laughs> For everybody. <laughs> now, um, do you ever get hangry? <laughs> do I get hangry? You would be the best. I, I do know. That was a loaded question. <laughs> you definitely get hangry yeah. and irritable and maybe a little bit snippy, but I do too. So, you know, 
it works because of that. Uh, but that's something that I also like to really be able to explain to clients is just when it comes to your mood and your mental health, that being able to have a consistent food and fuel source is only going to help with that. And there's so many times where I might not be in the best headspace. I might be in a place where I am, again, grumpy or snippy or again, just very like down on myself. And sometimes just having some food can change all of that. And it, it sometimes you get in your head of like, no, I'm not that hungry. So I, it's not that I need food right now. But especially eating in more regular intervals, I can tell when I've like surpassed an interval. And then I'm like, let me just have a snack and then see how I feel. And normally I end up feeling a little bit better. <laughs> Yeah, one of the things I always bring up to clients is that if you don't have a structure to your day with your nutrition and you're just kind of eating as an afterthought, it's just kind of like being plugged in where it fits, you're often just going to find yourself in these stints of higher irritability, making poor choices of like how you're responding to things. And, and by having that structure to your nutrition, you're eliminating that hangry window because you know like how long you can probably go in between meals, depending on the size of them and, and those different factors, especially as you track more consistently, you're going to have a better feel for like really what that window can be for yourself before that next meal needs to be had. And so by having that structure, you're going to improve your mood throughout the day. And it's really nice to have a <laughs> steady influx of mood all day rather than having these big ebbs and flows that you're trying to manage because you've gone too long since your last meal. Yeah. And even just, I know we talked about like energy and mood, but when it comes to like your mental energy and focus and ability to do different stuff in that regard, and I think people often try to equate food of, I need to earn my food, of I need to do physical activity to then be able to eat. And there is a certain degree of like, yes, if you move more, you might have some more food in place. But I think a lot of people underestimate of how much energy and fuel your body uses at rest. It, it's something where if I'm just sitting at my desk, I still need fuel to be able to do the things that I want to do, to focus, to be able to use my brain and for my brain to function the way that it needs to. And it's not that, oh, I haven't uh, worked out today, so I don't deserve more food. It's I have used my body, and even if my body is just sitting here doing nothing, it's still burning calories. It's still using fuel because think of all the functions that are happening in your body, your digestive system, your reproductive system, everything that is moving and grooving in your body is needing fuel to do so. Certainly. And what about skin health? I feel like everybody's willing to do, you know, inject this into my face, take this specific supplement, but by having a quality nutrient intake, vitamins and minerals being prioritized, your skin health, your, your teeth, your bones, all these things are going to be positively impacted and be much stronger, um, brighter, looking just younger, all those things being in place by managing your nutrition. And so instead of jumping to the next product to try and avoid the wrinkles that you may be experiencing as you age, how about we look at, at quality nutrition being the, the first stop there? And I just think about like, if I think back to like eight, nine years ago, not there's other things that I've done to improve like my skin overall. Uh, and some of them aren't even like specific products. It's just different uh, routines and things that I've done of like not touching my face, not putting my phone against my face, making sure my hands are clean before I wash my face, like little things like that. That was one of my biggest ones. Yeah. I felt like an idiot once I realized that. Yeah. That one really, really, you know, put on a light bulb that I felt should have been on for a while. Yeah. The fact that I didn't wash my hands before I washed my face was such an interesting. Yeah. I mean, I had done it probably until, I mean, until you told me about it. Yeah. <laughs> and it was a massive and duh moment. <laughs> there's a few other things. So I'm not saying like, oh, just food only is what you need to do to have clear skin. I'm not saying that, but I am saying it is a big aspect of when I look back, there was so much of, I was eating food that was not truly like helping me or benefiting me. Not only was I eating foods that I knew I had sensitivities to, and in my case, that was dairy, and it was causing me to my skin to be inflamed and to react, but it was something because I wasn't eating nutrient-dense foods, uh, that wasn't really a main part of my diet at all, then I just was inflamed. And again, I my skin just looked 
so much worse quality overall. And that's something I'm so thankful for. And a lot of what I do when it comes to my health is actually fueled by aesthetics. And I am okay with that because then it's led me to health and then prioritizing health from that. But if it takes you of like, ooh, let me try this out and see if my skin gets better, then all the power to you. Absolutely. So my question for you is, if your nutrition was to slip, what's the first thing that you notice within how your body's functioning that goes with it? Oh gosh, I feel like I just thought of like a million things at <laughs> once because it affects so much and all the things that we just mentioned. I will say one thing that like almost immediately comes off is going to be my digestion mm. of my digestion starts to go off of like, again, not eating in regular intervals, um, being in a place where I might be eating too close to bed or eating um, different allotments of foods or different types of foods. Uh, my digestion can really take a turn. But outside of that, I would say like my biggest thing is going to be my energy. And I was going through a, a stint um a few months ago where I was just under eating due to stress and a few other aspects. And that just compounded so many other things of me not feeling good, not wanting to train because I didn't have the energy to train. And then once I got into eating food, I was like, oh, I want to do all these things. I just literally felt like I was on zero. So why would I think that I could go and do those things? Yes. I, I will say my energy is definitely number one. And then number two, that goes right alongside of it is going to be my mood. <laughs> I'm oh, very irritable and crappy to be I around. I will <laughs> agree with that on your mood big time. <laughs> so if you're getting nutrition back into alignment, what's the first thing that you see get back in, in sync or, or upregulate? I, again, my digestion kind of gets back into place and then my my energy. So I feel like they go hand in hand if they're the first ones that I notice and then the first ones to come back um, just because like they make an immediate impact. Like it's not something of let me do this for a few weeks and then see how I feel. It's like almost immediately, even if it's just one day of hitting my food or being in a better place, I almost immediately feel better from that. I can agree. Now, this, we may have just answered this question, but I still want to ask it in terms of, of self-confidence. Do you experience any difference because of your nutrition? Yes, <laughs> yeah. it is. Again, it's something where a lot of what I do now for my health stemmed from a place of, I just wanted to look better and I just wanted to look a certain way. And I think that's completely fine to have that mentality towards things because we're human beings and we're allowed to want different things and maybe not even have a reason for it. It doesn't have to be for your health, although it's a nice side effect to be able to lump in there. And it's something where truly being able to understand what my body needs needed to fuel it allows me to have so much more self-confidence and not only confidence from the state of like, I don't have to worry, am I doing things right all the time, but just confidence overall of how I look, feel, and function because they all go together of your looks, your feels, and your function of how things work. And when nutrition is off, that is going to affect how my body functions, how efficient it is within functioning. It is also going to affect how I feel and how I look. And so if those things go by the wayside, then I like my self-confidence really goes by the wayside as well as then I'm not also like keeping the promises I made to myself because me personally, like I've made promises to myself of like what I want to have in place for my nutrition. And when those go by the wayside, then I'm not trusting myself. I am not pushing towards that self-confidence of actually doing the things I said I was going to do. So it affects me hugely when it comes to my self-confidence. And there's just been times, like if I think back to uh, maybe I go a time frame and I'm just like, oh, I'm just going to like eat whatever. I'm like tired of meal prepping. I'm tired of eating these certain meals. Within three days, I'm like, oh my gosh, I feel bad and not guilty that's not the kind of bad I feel. It is literally like I do not feel the quality that I know that I can. And once you felt as good as you know you can, when you go back down, it's like this is this sucks mm -hmm. so bad where I spent so much of my life in that down, I didn't realize I was so down. And then once I got to feeling better, it was like, oh, I don't want to go back to there ever again. 
I always say that my most self-confident version is the best digesting version. Mm -hmm. And so if my my digestion is in sync, I'm the most self-confident. And so to have my digestion in sync is to have my nutrition in alignment. And so it all kind of intertwines with one another. And, uh, I, I, you know, a lot of clients align with that. I can be the same body fat level of my digestion is doing good. And I've got my nutrition in place. I have the same body fat level as the version of myself who has that same body fat, but is not managing my digestion and is not having my nutrition in alignment. I'm a much more confident version here, not because of the body fat change, but because of how I'm taking care of myself. Mm-hmm. And I can show up so much better um, within the workspace, within our relationship, within my friends and, and all these different things. And so it, it's just, it plays such a huge role. Yeah, I'll definitely agree to that digestion as I've already touched on it a few times, but it's even something of like when you're not digesting food well, that's going to affect your mentality, your emotions. Um, There's going to be so much that goes into it, not just how you are looking. It is going to affect your energy as well because it's not just you are what you eat, but you are what you digest. So if you're not digesting the food properly, then that's going to throw off the nutrients that you might be getting from it or, again, how your body is being able to put energy towards things. So if you're having problems digesting things, then your body's like, hey, let's spend some more time on the digestion. Then that might take away from some other processes that you would rather have in place instead of sending like extra soldiers to your digestive tract. It's like, hey, I want those to be like building muscle. I want those to be focusing on this project I have for work. And so that is a huge one, um, as well as just again, like how I feel if my digestion is bad, like I ain't strutting around here, but when my digestion's feeling good. Oh, you're strutting, girl. Oh, I'm strutting. (laughs) You're strutting. (laughs) (laughs) All right. So our third question is one that I hear so frequently. Why do I never feel full after I eat? Your protein is too freaking low. (laughs) It's very true. Um, Fun fact, protein increases GLP-1. And if you guys have listened, I don't know what number episode this is, but going back to Ozempic and um, what Ozempic is doing, it is a GLP-1 mimetic, meaning that it is doing what protein is already doing for you. By increasing your protein consumption, it is going to raise GLP-1 levels, thus giving you greater satiation. Um, So I would encourage you, if you are feeling like you are always hungry, to look at your total protein consumption. And I would start looking at this at your total day. And let's say that you are under 100 grams. I would encourage you, get to 100 grams. Don't don't worry about, I need to have one pound per, uh, or one gram per pound of body mass right this moment. Focus on getting 100 and consistently having that in place. Because if you're to go from a, a position of 40 or 50 total grams of protein and you weigh 150 pounds and you want to have one pound, or gosh, one gram per pound of body mass, tripling your protein consumption is going to give you digestive stress. And I don't want you going around telling everybody that protein hurts your stomach and you can't eat this much because X, Y, and Z. It's because that's so much more food. And it's a lot to digest. Just like if you were to go from running one mile to running like 12 miles, it would well, be like- 12 times times three times is a little bit more, but If you're running concept. three miles and then went to go run nine miles- Facts. There you go. There we go. There's your little math equation there. But if you just jump up to that without any training to get to it, that's not going to feel freaking good. Even if that's not saying that nine miles is bad for you, it's just let's think about how we go about it. A little progression. So I have a simple progression to share with you all is that let's say you're trying to get to that 150 grams and we're first trying to get to 100. So we've spent one to maybe three weeks having a consistent 100 grams of intake every single day. Our digestion feels good. We're feeling more energetic. We're recovering better from our training. Now, every two to three weeks, I want you to increase that total protein consumption each day for 20 grams. So that first one to three weeks, you're at 120 grams. And then the next week or the next you know time that you make a bump up, maybe you're at 135 or 140 grams and you make your way to that 150 over a duration of time. It's not just going from 100 to 150 because now we're having a big bump again. And I want your digestion to be in the best place possible. And so if we can get to a place where we're gradually increasing, we're going to be feeling better and we're also going to be digesting those nutrients better. So it's a win, win, 
When? <laughs> One of my favorite stories in regards to like protein satiation is that I would say it was probably like four or five years ago. And my parents were both like wanting to get into tracking macros and they were confused by it. And so I made them sample days based on like the food that they were already eating. I just adjusted some amounts and then I presented it to them. And for my dad, it was something that in his sample day, it had so many things that he loved, but it was a big point to get his protein intake up. And at that time, he weighed like 180 to 200 pounds. And I was just like, let's get your protein to like 130, 140, because making that jump to like a 160, 180 is going to be too much too fast. And it's going to be something where if your meal type changes so much, then that can also leave you in a place where you're just like, I don't enjoy this. This isn't sustainable when you have to kind of find what those meals look like. And so I had the day and in the day it had that he could still have a beer or two. And then he also had like a full Hershey's chocolate bar that he could have, but the protein was increased and he would finish the first day. And he was like, I am full as a tick. Like I am so full. Are you sure this is going to help me lose weight? I, I'm so full. And I was like, yes, you're going to be okay. Within a week, he had literally lost 10 pounds. His genes were falling off of him. And he could not believe it because he was like, every day I am so full. And he's like, and I, I still the first can time. have chocolate <laughs> and I can still have beer. And he's like, but I am so full. But my pants are falling off of me. <laughs> and it was just like such a perfect example to me of like what protein actually does and how much it truly helps with satiation. And I also remember that last year around this time, I went on a trip with my sister and her friends. And one of them was asking me about how much protein I try to hit in a day. And I was like, well, I personally try to aim, but between like 150 to, to 170. And she was gobsmacked. She could not believe that I just said that number. And I was like, how much do you aim for? She was like, I'm like really happy with myself if I get to like 50 or 60 grams a day. And I was like, let me put you on Chobani shakes because she was also vegetarian. So I was like, let me put you on these Chobani shakes. I want you to get to at least 80 grams, but like the goal would be 100 grams minimum per day. And she still messages me and she's like, I'm still drinking the Chobani shakes. I'm feeling so much better. And she was someone who was doing like yoga. And I think she also taught yoga and doing a bunch of activity throughout the day. And then was talking about how she just could not feel like she was getting enough food and she couldn't push herself to eat more food. And I think that part of it could be of people being in a place of if I'm just trying to get more calories in that they think I could be doing something wrong of like, I shouldn't have to eat this many calories. Because like you said, it's kind of like this mentality in the society of like eating less, but really being able to prioritize that protein. Another fun fact about protein, it doesn't have a storage place in the body. Now that's not to say that, hey, if you just eat only protein, you will never gain fat ever. But it is to say that protein is likely not going to be the macronutrient that causes you to gain unnecessary fat. And so being able to get that to an adequate amount is only going to help your body composition. It is going to help your nutrition. It is going to help your satiation. It is going to help so freaking much. Amen. Are you sick and tired of your glutes not growing? turning around in the mirror and seeing a board for a booty. I've been coaching for nearly a decade, helping thousands of women reach their goals. The most common goal, grow my glutes. Women in their 30s, 40s, 50s, and even 60s, able to grow their glutes with the guidance of my training programs. And for all this time, I've kept my best glute growth secrets only for my one-on-one -on -one clients. And that changes today. We just released our 12-week glute growth program in the PD training app. It is a four-day program with exercise and volume adjustments every three weeks. You can easily access the program through our app and track every single workout. Each exercise will have a detailed video teaching you exactly how to perform each and every movement. And guess what? I am no longer gatekeeping. I'm sharing every single one of my best glute growth secrets inside this program because you are awesome and I want you to have this program. I'm going to give you $25 off, making it a fraction of what you spent at Starbucks this past month. Use code POD. The link to purchase will be in the description. Now let's get back to the show. The second reason why you may not be feeling full after you eat is that your sleep sucks. 
What research has shown us is that if you have an extended period of time where your sleep is inadequate, so the quality and the quantity are less than what they should be, we're going to see lower leptin levels. Now, leptin is a hunger hormone that is going to tell you that you're full. So if we're not having a adequate secretion of that hormone, we're just going to constantly be full. As well as if we're having poor sleep, we're going to have generally higher cortisol levels. And with those higher cortisol levels, we're going to basically seek relief from that cortisol. And what what's going to give us some of that relief is sugary dense foods. So hypercaloric newt are foods that give us this immediate dopamine response of like, ah, I finally have some relief from this cortisol and I feel like I'm no longer stressed out. And then 10 seconds later, you're like, I'm still hungry. <laughs> and so then you just continue to overconsume, and you're like, I'm never full. And I just keep shoveling these donuts in my mouth and I don't understand. And so your sleep being poor, as well as being in a very stressed state, is something that I would address. That was going to be something I brought up of that is a huge sign for you of if your sleep isn't good, that you start like craving foods that are like more so considered junk foods. And again, not to say you can never have those foods, but we got to think about when we're having them, all that shit. So it's something where you are like, all I want right now is like sugary food. And then it does put you in that place where you have no satiation. And then you have like a sugar crash as well. And then you can also be in a place where that affects your sleep the next night yeah. of not having proper nutrients in place and possibly being in a place where you're having these crashes because of the sugar on top of not having adequate sleep. And then maybe even compounding that with adding some caffeine in place. Um, so it can be a slippery slope. Yeah, there's there's not a time that my discipline with nutrition gets tested more if I've got multiple nights in a row of poor sleep because I've really got to stick to my guns in that scenario because I almost have like an, an aversion to the foods that I would normally be eating and all I ever want is pizza. Pizza is like the number one. Like mm -hmm. I can just body a whole pizza in that scenario yeah. and be like, I'm good. And then I'll just be done. Um, what else? Uh, chocolate. Chocolate and pizza are probably the two that's like, that's all my mind wants mm -hmm. because it's it's seeking relief. It's seeking some level of, of dopamine response to where I can have stress come down because I generally in those times of, of poor sleep, I'm also in higher stress environments. And so those two things in conjunction as I said, suck. <laughs> now this next one, which might be another reason why you are not feeling full, this might anger some people because I know people get a little bit frustrated when people give this as a answer to their problems, but you could not be drinking enough water. Yes. Um, dehydration can disguise itself as hunger. And so if you haven't been drinking adequate water, you may be in this state of like, obviously being hydrated, but you're feeling as though that you should continue to eat more food. And so if you find yourself in that place and it's like, well, I just ate, why am I still hungry? Have a glass or two of water and then see if that alleviates. And then you can also add a little bit of sodium in place as well. Cause it could be something where when we're talking about hydration, it's not just fluid, which we've talked about a number of times on this podcast, it's going to come down to minerals and it's going to have water involved. And so you could have just like a, I always screw this up. The ta it's teaspoon. teaspoon, teaspoon and tablespoon, not in my repertoire of knowledge. Things like table. I, I know, is I know. bigger I, I than can, like a pot of tea. I know, I, I, but I always, when I'm in just general conversation, I have to really step back and think <laughs> about it. But a fourth of a teaspoon, which is roughly like 200 to 300 milligrams of caf or caffeine mm -hmm. of sodium, throw that to the dome and have a, a glass or two of water. And that will be helpful. If you find yourself still hungry, then you probably should have something to eat. Mm -hmm. But that would be my, my first step there. Yeah. I will say that another thing to mention within water is that I find that people who like are normally consistent with water kind of brush this one off of like, I normally drink my water. So like, it's not water. And I find myself in this too, of like, I'm someone who is normally like on my water, but every once in a while I'll go through like a week or so span where I just am drinking less water, whether it's intentional or unintentional. And I don't always register that like, oh, let me look at water because it's something that I normally have nailed down. And so it's something that I do mention to clients of like, hey, 
maybe just double check that you are drinking enough water throughout the day and throughout the week, even though I know you normally are on top of it. And what I'll do to make sure in case I get like lost in like counting how many bottles I'm filling up is that I will just take a gallon of water and not that I drink from the gallon because that's just like too much for me. That's a little bit extra. I will literally just take the gallon and put it at like my desk like on the ground next to my desk and fill up my cup throughout the day. So then I have that visual aspect of how much have I drank. And then I can also be at the end of the day of like, did this feel like way more water than I've been drinking the past few days? Or did it seem pretty on par with the amount? Because if it is, then it could be of like, hey, maybe the weather's changing. Maybe you've been sweating a little bit more, losing a little bit more electrolytes. Maybe you do need either a bump in water and or electrolytes to make sure that that you have that adequate hydration. And don't be afraid to alternate the you know, the liquids that you're consuming. Like you can, I'm someone who, if I'm just drinking straight water, I get real tired of it real fast. And so having juices, if you've got the calories to be able to do it, if you uh, want to have diet soda, if you want to have Gatorade Zeros, Powerade Zeros, things like that, that have a little bit of flavor to give you some variability in the, the fluids that you're consuming, because this is still going to impact your hydration levels. Um, I know I have to do that. It's not like I go 30 ounces of water, Gatorade, 30 ounces of water, Gatorade, but it, you know, I, I intertwine them when I need them. Yeah. And if it's something that's going to push you to drink more, because sometimes clients or I'll get comments to be like, well, I've heard I should just like only get my liquids through water. And I'm like, bro, if it's going to help you either drink more water or just get more fluids in you then go for it. Like I'm all for anything that is going to encourage you to get to where you want. And I'm not on this hierarchy of you didn't drink just straight water. Like, well, I guess you're not serious about your fitness goals. <laughs> it's like, I get it. I literally have to have one flavored drink throughout the day to make sure I get in the rest of my water. Yeah. The last one I've got is um, you eat while you're distracted. And I think that many people can correlate with this or, or resonate of sitting in front of the TV with a, your, a good friend, your spouse, you guys have a bowl of salsa and tortilla chips. You guys are engaged in she your gone. favorite show. <laughs> and before you know it, that bag of chips is gone. You reach in there and that boy is empty. Did you plan to eat the whole bag of chips? Did you even realize that you were getting more full as the show continued? Probably not. And you were very distracted. You were having a great time with your with your friend or your spouse, watching a great show, maybe trash TV, whatever, you know, floats your boat. That's a, a great instance in which that distraction kept you in a place where you're still hungry. And so being able to be present when you're consuming meals, and I know, I know the luxury and the the comfort of what putting your phone up when you're watching a meal and then watching YouTube or scrolling TikTok or whatever the case may be, like that is an enjoyable experience. It is, it's, it is uh, distracting. It's all these different things, right? And if we can get to a place where we are just looking at the bowl of food and being mindful with the foods that we're consuming, you're going to very quickly see you get full faster, you realize how much more food you're consuming by just simply being present with what's there. And uh, I, I speak from such a place of experience here <laughs> <laughs> because I have been notorious, especially when you're living by yourself. I think mm -hmm. that that's such an easy one. When you're living by yourself, you put on the TV, you turn something on your phone um, while you're eating a meal just to have kind of like, you know, background noise or whatever the case may be. But it really, if you're struggling with hunger signaling, this is a great place to start. Yeah, and that's also something if you're eating distracted, you're likely not chewing your food well enough. And that can be something of, I mean, test it. Eat a meal where you don't chew very well and then sit there and make sure you're properly chewing your food. You might be uh, halfway or two thirds of the way through the meal and be like, oh my gosh, I'm so full. Versus you're like, I ate this yesterday in two minutes and it it didn't leave a dent in my hunger. Um, and so truly being able to properly chew your food um, can make a difference. And often when you're distracted, you're not properly chewing your food. Absolutely. So we already talked about stress being a, a driver here. I've got other factors of your eating 
too sugary of carbs and not eating enough fiber. I think that that can be something that's important to talk about. Your total dietary intake is too low in fats. And I would say that if it's under 40 grams for your entire day, this may be a situation where you're just having higher hunger signaling. But if your total fats are under 40 grams, you're probably in a pretty decent caloric deficit and chasing a larger goal. So that just may be part par for the course type situation. Your calorie output exceeds your calorie intake by far too much. You're in too deep of a caloric deficit. Excessive alcohol consumption, you're gonna be getting calories from the alcohol, but also, as many of us know listening to this, when, when you've had a couple too many drinks, going to get pizza or going to the hot dog stand or whatever the case may be, it's, it hits too good. So <laughs> that's where those extra calories are gonna come from and you're gonna have higher hunger signaling. Um, drinking your calories through shakes and sodas. Um, I actually just had a client who did not realize that regular Coke had calories in it. And I'm like, where do you think that the sweetness comes from? I mean, that is a really sweet drink, but you know, it is what it is. The last thing was uh, maybe a type of medication that you're taking. Mm -hmm. So if you have multiple medications that you are taking and you're feeling like you're never satiated, maybe you look at some of the side effects that you may be uh, experiencing from the medications that you're on. Yeah, those are all great examples. And I know we said we were only, only going to do three questions today, but I do have a little bit of a bonus question to ask you um, in regards to nutrition. So when it comes to changing your the way that you eat or the types of foods that you eat. How do you go about explaining that to people around you and or your family? Because I know that that can be a really difficult thing to navigate when you're trying to change your lifestyle or your diet of then trying to either get other people on board or just get them aware of what your new goals are. So how would you explain that to a loved one or friend. So this is something from personal experience as well as working with so many clients to have this conversation. So the first thing is going to be really assessing where that family member or or significant other is at. Like if they're on such a polar end of where you're trying to be, like they want to have the fattiest foods, like you've got a southern grandmother who is like I'm making biscuits and gravy and it is going to be the most fatty dense foods ever and you're wanting to make dietary changes to that, that's going to be, you know, that's going to take time. Mm -hmm. That's not just a singular conversation. And then we move forward. It's like, how can we change some of the ingredients to this food to be more complementary to the calories that I'm wanting to consume or how I'm wanting to nourish my body. And that's going to come down to education with your grandmother or with your, with your parent or with your significant other. And so really teaching on it and coming from a place of like, I'm not trying to change you or that you're doing something wrong. Because oftentimes when people are a approached about their nutrition, it's like, feels like an attack on them. Mm -hmm. Like I'm doing something wrong and you think that uh, maybe you're better than me or whatever the case is. It, it becomes a very defensive situation. And so we want it to be something where it's more conversational and, and it's, it's positive and it's not something that we're bashing someone down. And so going with the approach of education and explaining these different things is going to be the big key. So you need to be up on your education and be in a place where you are confident in what you are talking about. Because if you're just going in and saying, well, I have a coach and they're wanting me to eat less calories, it, that doesn't have a whole lot of backing. They're gonna be like, stop it, you're gonna eat this food. And then the cycle continues. But if you come in from a place of, these are the reasons why I want to change. These are the things that I'm wanting to change. And this is how it's going to improve my life and how it can be helpful to you too, if you're interested. That's gonna be a much more welcoming conversation for you to have when you're presenting this to your family members, significant other, whomever it may be. And so looking at it more from a, a journey standpoint, rather than it just being one conversation, because I can assure you, it's not gonna be just one conversation. As beautiful and painless as it would be of like, I'm doing this, you guys need to follow along, and then everybody just jumps on ship. That would be amazing, but I've never seen that happen. <laughs> and it's really something where you just have to have patience and take the baby steps that are necessary for everyone to get on board. And if you can find little pockets to where you can change things of maybe the ingredients or where you guys are going to eat, or if you can make different suggestions, bringing your own dish to a different uh, family gathering, those are steps in the right direction. And maybe by the third Christmas, and I know it's like, dude, I'm not waiting three years. Well, there, you may only see these people, you know, three times over a three year period. Period. That would be pretty pretty awesome. And three trips to be able to change how the the structure of what your family's eating for a given holiday. So I that's where I would start. Yeah. I would say one of the main things I always try to 
talk to people about is even just expressing that you are changing what you are doing. Because I think the back to in college when I made the change, I kind of just made the change and then was like, why is everyone not on board? And I never really took the time to tell people that I was making a change and like you said, of why I was making a change. And then from there, it was something where I didn't wanna make someone feel bad about what they were eating or feel like I was judging them for different aspects. And so one, th- one other thing I always try to be able to take forward is that you are making this change. And that doesn't mean that other people are making that change. If you might be able to give them education or change the way they look at things for sure. But just because you are making a change does not mean that they want to make a change. And so even with the example of like the grandma and they cook a certain way, I talk to clients about this of, hey, maybe it's that we need to restructure your meals going into that so that you can be present and maybe it's not offending them. Maybe it's just you love their cooking and you don't get it that often and you want to eat it. And it's like, okay, how do we rearrange things to make it that you can enjoy that meal and still stay on track with everything else without making it other people's problem? Because I think people often will be like, well, why isn't food prepared for me? I just can't eat this, so I guess I'm just not going to go. And how I personally worked around it is that I went to everything, and I would either um, eat before or eat after or bring my food with me, and then I allowed any and all questions that people had. It wasn't something where they would say, oh, why are you eating that? And I just say, oh, just because I am. It was like, oh, I'm working on this goal right now. And this is something that I really wanted to be able to eat. And if they have more questions past that, then be willing to answer them. Because again, you have to recognize people might not understand and you can't take it as they're questioning what I'm doing and they don't want what's best for me. They might not know that that's what's best for you. They don't know the demons that are going on inside your head. So maybe they're looking at it and thinking, why do you feel like you need to change the way you eat? I loved you the way that you were before. And you could be there like, I've been fighting internal demons about my self-confidence, how I feel, how I function. And if you can express that to them without coming defensive or um, being in a place where you're pointing a finger at anyone, that is only going to make things better because you are there standing on business of like, this is what I'm doing. This is why I'm doing it. You do not have to join me in doing this, but I am willing to answer in any and all questions. And it's even something like still to this day, I'll go to events and people will make comments of either, I didn't know you could have this, or I didn't know you were allowed to eat this, or, oh, can you eat this? And I'm always so willing to answer any and all questions, even though I'm like, man, I talked about this all day. I talked about it on the podcast. I talked about it on YouTube. YouTube. I talked about it with my clients. I did it for myself. It's something where if they are there and they're asking the question, I am so willing to explain it to them because why not? Like the only thing is maybe they're like, huh, okay, cool. That's that's for you. And they might be like, I'm glad that she explained that instead of just telling me that's what she was doing. Um, or maybe they'll walk away and be like, oh, that's, that's a good point. Maybe I should think of food that way. Maybe I might have more questions down the road because I used to get so caught up in making people do what I was doing because I felt like what I was doing was right, where now I much more take the mindset and the headspace to, I'm going to do what is right for me. I'm happy to explain it to anyone one that is going to ask questions. And then from there, I'm just going to continue to live my life how I feel it best suits me. Um, And I find that that's been, again, the best for me. Um, And the most responsive people have been to things uh, around me and willing to to continue to ask questions because they don't feel like I'm going to mow them down or act like I'm holier than now. I'll just be like, oh, okay, yeah, let's talk through that. What what does that meal look like for you? Um, yeah, that doesn't mean that that's good or bad. This means this. And it just gives them a new perspective on food. So you can be a part of the change. I think that nutrition is so misunderstood, so, um, so much misinformation about it. And there is just so much that that people cannot grasp when it comes to food. And if I and anyone else can be a part of making food more accessible and more understandable, then like I am all in for that just to be able to also realize like I'm taking this on for me and not for someone else. The last thing I will add is if you have a family like mine, you need to have thick skin because a way that 
many of my family members work through things is by making fun of each other. And so if you are someone who does not have thick skin and you're trying to make this change and it is going to hurt your feelings by people kind of picking on you a little bit, you're going to have to toughen up a little bit. It's just the reality of the situation and try not to take it personal because oftentimes when those things are said to you, it's not because they're poking fun at you. They're dealing with their own stuff in their mind. And that's where it's really coming from. And so if you can understand that it's that person dealing with their own thing and it's just being outwardly expressed to you, that frame really allows for you to be like, okay, I don't need to like take that in. I understand Mm -hmm. where you're coming from, but I want to give you a real answer. And if you're quick witted, dish it right back, (laughs) throw it right back in their face. I think that's fair game. So that was the last thing I wanted to add on that question. I appreciate you asking that bonus because I think it's a good question. Yeah, I do too. Uh, Well, I think that this was very helpful to be able to talk through that. But again, if you guys have any extra questions about something that we've gone over specifically in this episode or just other nutrition questions, then feel free uh, to send them our way because we'd love to be able just to provide more information about nutrition. And if you are like, hey, I've followed along or I've consumed a lot of your guys' free education, whether that is through the podcast, Instagram, or wherever it might be, and I'm still having troubles getting to where I want to go, then go ahead and hit the link below and we'll get you on a free call with our enrollment specialist and be able to talk through like what your goals are and what that looks like to see if we can help you. Because sometimes it's not a matter of knowing what you need to do. A lot of us know that protein is good for us or that we might need to eat a certain amount or that water is good for us. But oftentimes the hard part comes from the implementation and knowing how it works for you. And having a coach can help with that of just kind cutting out a lot of that work that you might have to do of that um, troubleshooting and trial and error. So if you're interested in talking about nutrition more and how it applies to you, then you can hit down that link, hit down that link below, hit that link down below, um, and we're happy to get on a call. Thanks so much for listening, and we'll catch you in the next one.